Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Li Zhang here. I've known him for almost 15 years probably since he arrived at the University of Washington across the lake as a graduate student. Um, did a lot of great work in computational photography back then and continuing to this day. Um, I guess about five or six years ago we lost him to the other UW, uh, which is uh, University of Wisconsin. <laughs> and he's going to talk to us today about uh, some new uh, image sensors that are coming out and how to use those sensors both for understanding the world and for producing great images, I guess. Okay, so yeah. I'll let, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me here. So uh, let me start the talk um, by showing you a very interesting picture. So this is a picture of um, taken in 2005 where, uh, when the Pope was announced. That was uh, eight years ago. And uh, there's another comparison picture uh, like this. So I guess for researchers in this field, when we see this, we got very excited because the mobile devices are really a part of our life. And the, so we're using it to take pictures. If we can do, do anything on the camera or to the pictures that, were, that are taken, we, it was very, we very likely may you know, impact uh, our daily life. Okay? So as researchers, I think uh, I'm interested in uh, uh, several questions in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, area. So one is usually when we want to take good pictures, we sort of use a big camera. Right? So now most likely we're going to use sort of small cameras. Can we sort of uh, improve the imaging performance of these small cameras to make it more comparable to this? Okay, so that's one type of questions. Um, uh, like, a, uh, for example, dynamic range, low light performance. And uh, the second question is, okay, once we are able to very easily take questions, we're going to uh, take pictures, we're going to see a lot of, we will have a lot of pictures. How do we um, uh, browse and uh, navigate through these images? Okay. So there's a third question, which is how do we extract some knowledges from these pictures, like uh, doing face recognition or more general sort of object segmentation and the recognition. Okay? Um, so I have done a little bit of work in these areas, so I will discuss this, th these works with you. I will start with uh, uh, the first one. Okay. So high dynamic range images. So this is a high dynamic range uh, images are important. So you can use iPhones these days to take uh, HDR images. and. Um, so as we all know, the way it works is you take a succession of um, pictures with different exposure times. So this longer, wider bar means a longer exposure. And uh, if we merge them, we get this nicer looking picture. Okay? So you can see that the reason we want, we want the longer exposure is that uh, this part is so dark, if we use shorter exposures, we cannot uh, see it too much. Um, but if we use the long exposure, then when the scenes is mo moving, okay, so we're going to have blur here. Okay, so then that becomes a problem. Um, so not too many work have addressed this issue, meaning that uh, address the blur issue when we uh, re reconstruct the high dynamic range images. Okay, so uh, okay, so if the issue is, you know, we have a lot of noise in the dark region. Okay, so maybe an alternative is this. So we just take a succession of short exposure uh, pictures. And uh, maybe we can somehow remove the noise by sort of somehow aggregating all the measurements here. OK, so this is a, another alternative. Um, so then the question is, OK, which is better? Shall we do this, trying to remove the blur here? Or shall we sort of, a, sort of a take us, uh, sort of remove the noise uh, in this sequence? So, um, and because when you, when you use a short exposure time, within a certain period of time, you can take more pictures. Okay? So then the, sort of there's this design question, okay, which sort of a scheme should we use? Should we take a very short num a, a, a sequence of 
sort of noisy images where you should you know, take this type of sequences. And uh, I think um, in, 2010, in 2010, we had a paper so we did an analysis comparing these two schemes. So our conclusion is that this is tend to work better in practice. So you want to estimate the motion between these frames and then remove the noise. Um, and there are some uh, more general analysis from Srinayar's group, which also compare this type of uh, image capture with uh, other um, sort of a coded aperture imaging. Uh, for example, fluttered shutter and uh, sort of coded aperture imaging um, to see, okay, which is better and in which scenario. Okay, so I will show you some examples of uh, my work. So for example, uh, is there a way to dim the light? Um, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that's fine. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a trade off between the, the people that are. Oh, I see. Uh huh. <clears throat> um, so you just speak in the. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, for example, in this low light condition, we, we take a picture of this birthday uh, cake. And uh, if we just um, blow out, sort of uh, amplify on the pixel intensity, we tend to get this. Okay. And uh, so the idea is, okay, how about we take a very short sequence of noisy images, and um, then you can, and this is like a toe mapping result. Of when you do this, uh, there's a, very likely your hand may be shaking, so you take a very short sequence, you, get, you can recover um, all these nice details. Okay, so this is one example. So let me show you another example. So this is uh, the noise level, and uh, so this there's a motion. This motion is smoother. Okay. Okay. So this is a um, sort of a, a demonstrative concept. Okay. If we can t mm, capture a sequence of images, then we can still reconstruct the high dynamic range images. Okay. The question is. Okay. Is it this problem? Uh, is the problem solved? So if you think about it, it's not quite. Because what does that mean? If you want to take a high dynamic range videos on a cell phone, then your, your cell phone has to you know, work at this very high frame rate. Then usually that means you're going to consume a lot of power. Okay? So, so then we thought about, OK, so if we, do, we take high, uh, high frame rate because we want to avoid the motion, then sometimes maybe the scene is not moving. So maybe we want to do this uh, image sampling in a more adaptive way, meaning that if there's mo no motion, we want to slow down. We, want, we can use a longer explorer time. Okay, so that's the another work we did. So use the est motion estimation to control the explorer time. So usually the explorer time is controlled by the brightness. If it's bright enough, you use short explorer. If it's dark, then you use long explorer. So, but we can use motion to c to control uh, the explorer time. Okay, so I, uh, I think three, I think maybe three years ago, I think there are some cameras can do this, but that's only, f uh, only for static shots. So now we haven't found sort of a video cameras that can do this. So we build a uh, prototype to, sort of, uh, to, exp uh, to experiment with this concept. So I will show you this, uh, how it works. So this is like a regular video okay, as we're moving. You can see that once we move, uh, this is a constant, constant explorer, then things get blurred. Okay. But here, once it starts moving, thing, things get noisier. You see, the, you see the difference? So here, once it moves, uh, we have an underlying sort of motion detection. Um, you get a noisy reconstruction. Um, and you get a noisy capture because we reduce the shutter speed. Um, here, the, the, the explorer time is constant, so you get. Okay, so the idea is, okay, maybe from this type of uh, uh, measurement, we can get a better image reconstruction. Yes? Is the motion estimate obtained with a, uh, like an inertial sensor? No, it's, a, it's like a purely image-based, um, like Lucas Kanadi type of uh, motion estimation. But it has to be fast enough to drive the camera, and this is already a high-speed capture. Uh, uh, right, so we did this. We, we didn't do this on a phone. We have a laptop connected to a point grid camera. So the motion estimation is done uh, on the laptop. Yeah. 
So any other questions? Okay, so, okay, so then, so you can see that okay, uh, at a particular moment, if this thing is moving fast, it's blur, and uh, in, in this capturing scheme, it's noisy. And in order to evaluate this, we did some evaluated this uh, scheme. We did some synthetic experiment. Suppose you have a panoramic image, and we sort of have a simulated camera moving this way. Okay. And first, if you look at the dashed red line, that's the signal noise ratio in the input, meaning that we we use a constant short exposure, meaning that it's, every frame is very noisy, so the signal to noise ratio is very low. Um, and then we can apply some video denoising method. For example, we used the Liu and um, Furyman's method, I think that's maybe three years ago. Yeah, you can bump up the signal noise ratio to this. Okay, so it works quite nicely. But if you use our, sort of our sort of adaptive uh, sampling, originally it's here, it's sort of a static. So that means the signal noise ratio is pretty high. Okay, and then you start to move, so it's moving fast. Then you reduce the explorer time, and suddenly the noise ratio, signal to noise ratio becomes low. And then once you come here, it stops and you move, stops. So you see that the stashed uh, um, black line is the signal to noise ratio in this adaptive captured, uh, uh, in this uh, motion based uh, uh, explorer control capture. Okay, and then based on this, you can do some video denoising, then we can get a better sort of a signal to a noise ratio. You can see that for this good, uh, for this good input images, we get a very high signal to noise ratio, and we can, um, we can get some improvement like, like this. So this is all single frame uh, results, right? So uh, well, actually, it's a sort of a aggregating multiple frames. So this, the, the solid lines are aggregating multiple Yeah. Yeah, the key benefit that we can get is you know, we have very good frames here, sort of a very good frames here, so that we can compute the optical flow, and uh, if we give more weights here, more weights here, so when we do the reconstruction, uh, we can get higher improvement. We can get better reconstruction. Why does the black dash line not go all the way down where the red dash line is? Uh, actually, it depends on the seed. Here, it touches the red line. Yeah. That means it's still exposing longer in the first second. Uh, that means here it moves really fast. So this is a sort of a conservative way of setting explorer to make it very short. So if there's a lot of motion in the scene, uh -huh. the, the, the objects move around, uh -huh. that affects the results. Yeah, if, if everything is moving, then you probably end up, so that's the worst case, you probably end up with something like this. Because we keep the... Right, 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 right. Yeah. Okay. So here are some comparison. Um, so this is again. So this is a synthetic example, since so that we can have ground truth. So this is the constant word time. It's it's uh, blurry and this is noisy input. So we can apply the so-called BM three D method on each frame to get the noise removed and. Uh, this is another sort of Liu and Freeman method to remove the noise, and uh, this is our method. You can see that this is a, our method is more similar. Um, uh, well, in terms of the sharpness, is probably more comparable to this. This is a, this is a almost the same, but slightly a little bit um, blurry. So this is the ground truth, and uh, if you if we compare the signal to noise ratio, so this is the input, the red solid line is the input. And we have two other sort of a BM 3D method and Leo and the Freeman method. They're somewhere here. And uh, sort of our method, you can uh, sort of do better. Okay. So, so this is another example. Uh, you can, s in this case, I think both the Leo and the Freeman method and the BM 3D method sort of over smooth the result a little bit. And this, this sort of a, in this result, the difference is much uh, is more clear. So this, our result is more comparable to the ground truth. So the key reason is that our method sort of switch between the spatial denoising and the temporal denoising. If the motion estimation is unreli unreliable, we use a single frame. Otherwise, we use um, sort of temporal information. Uh, so the, again, so this is the comparison. So this. Uh, uh, 
this black line and black line is our uh, result. Okay. Okay. So then, question is: Okay, is this is this all? So um, not really. So can you think of any issues with this? Okay. So there's uh, some issues. First of all, when we use the motion to control the exposure, we can only measure the previous two frames, right? Then use the motion to predict the next frame. But this prediction is always delayed. So if you're static, moving slowly, suddenly you move fast, then you, you know the next frame is wrong. Okay. So um, and not uh, right. So that's the main problem. In the end, we always have some sort of blurry frame um, uh, in the result. Um, in order to enhance this one, we have to somehow sort of doing some sort of a registration between a sharp one and a blurry one. When you say there's the delay, I mm -hmm. mean, IMUs can run at 200 hertz or something like that, right? So, mm -hmm. And most cell phones have some sort of inertial measurement built in, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. So, but the motion there, even if the, the camera is absolutely static, there could be scene motion. That's true. So, so that, that kind of motion uh, need to be estimated from the, from the frames. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so okay, if we ha then you have to do some registration between the blurry and the uh, sharp image. That becomes a tricky optical flow question because the 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 brightness constancy is is violated. So what you if you just use a regular flow, then you're going to somehow move these pixels to match with these uh, the, the 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 blurred intensity patterns. The flow will be wrong. Okay, so we address this problem in the paper. Um, in last CVPR, uh, it works quite nice uh, for the interior. So the basic idea is we want to compute a flow such that if you use that flow to blur out this one, uh, and then the blurred version will match up with this guy. Okay, so so that's the basic idea. So it works quite nice with these interior regions, but near the occlusion boundaries, the depth discontinuity, it, it's very hard. It's very hard. So, uh, so then I think we can still keep sort of improving writing papers, but um, in terms of having a real robust system, I think this is probably not the way to go. Okay. So then we sort of come up with this idea, uh, this sort of a randomized uh, uh, explorer uh, scheme. So if you look at this, um, this is an illustration on a 10 pixel camera. You have a 10 pixel camera. So, and, uh, so let me just say how it works. So for example, at time A, okay, at time A, you only read three pixels. These three pixels is pixel one. Okay, you read pixel one. And the pixel one has been exposed for two frames. So this is the explorer time. Okay. And then you also read pixel six. So pixel six has been exposed for four, four frames. Okay. That's the explore time. You also read this pixel nine, and it has a short explore time. Okay. For the pixels that you're not reading at this frame, it's going to continue to expose. For example, this one, pixel two, you don't read it, so it's being, it, it continues to expose. Okay. And then you come to the next time instant, Okay, we're going to read out, at, that, at this uh, frame, we're going to read out pixel 1 with this explore time, and the pixel 2 with this explore time. Does that make sense? And then, and also pixel 6 with this explore time. Okay, so the basic idea is, for another example, at this frame, we're going to read out pixel 3 with this explore time, and uh, I guess pixel 7 with this long explore time. Okay, so the basic idea is at each time, you're going to se select a subset of pixels and read them out. And yes? So the colors don't mean anything else? Yeah, the color doesn't mean anything. Just to distinguish one segment from the other. Right, 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 okay. right, right. Let's right. Parse the color. Yeah. 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 And so there are no gaps in any of the horizontal rows. Right, right, right. So right. And then the black line indicates read out, and then immediately you start exposing the right. game. Right, 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 right. So, um, the colors indicate exposure time, no. It's sort of a, it's a color, well, you can say that yellow means, yeah, yellow means eight frames, and uh, uh, the cyan or the green means four, yeah, four frames, yeah. Sorry. So for pixel three, does it, it 
it seems like sometimes you're supposed to for very long and sometimes for very short. Uh huh. Right. Um, it's like random, it's, right? It's, it's random. just random. Yeah, it's random. Yes. I, right now it's okay. random. Okay. Yeah. Right. Any Okay. So, so from this, okay, it's like we measure the sum of photons in this interval, right? And we sum the sum of photons in within this interval, right? We get the sum sort of a reduce the number of photons, then we, we want to recover the number of photons in this sort of cell and in this cell, in this cell. So if we can do that, we can, ca we can recover this sort of high speed uh, frames. And also because we have this interla interleaved the long explorer and short explorer, probably we can recover the high dynamic range ones. Okay, so, so sort of there are some, at least the potential advantages of doing this, one is it has 100%, nearly 100% light throughput. We're not wasting any light. And uh, it, you can, potentially we can simultaneously cover HDR and high speed videos. And uh, sort of we don't just constantly doing sampling and it has reduced the power consumption. And also I think that probably the very nice thing is it can be implemented on a single chip because it only requires this partial readout. Um, so I was talking to some people at the CVPR last week. So this one does not exist right now. So everything we do is simulation. But for the next generation CMOS um, sensors, we might be able to do this. So right now we can control per row, not per pixel uh, yet. Okay. So, uh, so this is like the first experiment we did. So we didn't design what's, we didn't, we haven't figured out what's the optimum pattern yet. So right now we only just uh, do a four explore time, one, two, four, eight, and uh, randomly permute them, assign them to each pixels. Okay. So, okay, so how do we re do the reconstruction? So we have these measurements. Those measurements are constraints, right? But the number of constraints is less than the number of pixels we want to recover. We need to have some adi additional regularizations. Okay, we do this sort of a block matching. So within the space-time volume, okay, so, you, so let's say if we consider, let's say this is a four by four by four, uh, uh, sort of a space-time patch. Um, and uh, if we can say, okay, these two ones, these two are very similar. So that gives us a regularization, right? So, and uh, typically when we work with regular videos, this sort of a space-time volume is very, is not very robust because of the motion is very fast, right? The templing, sampling, temporal sampling rate cannot compare with the spatial one. But here, each frame is this like a high frame, is a, this frame, we have a much higher sort of temporal, uh, temporal sampling rate. So each, for example, we're, we can be talking about like 200 frames per second. So that's why this space-time volume makes more sense in this scenario. Okay. So then if you look at this, we want to compare this volume with this volume. It's, it's a little bit tricky because of the sampling. We don't exactly know the pixel value here, right? When we compare this with this. So how can we do the comparison to say, okay, this block is similar to this block? So essentially, the problem is like this. So we have, so this yellow bar, okay? So this yellow bar is, is this one, okay? And we consider uh, here we have this uh, magenta, magenta bar and the yellow bar and the green one here. So this, these are, is that right? Yeah, I think this green, magenta, uh, blue, yellow. So this is a, this row. Okay, so we want to compare these four pixels with these four pixels. Okay, how, how are we going to do this? Okay, so we cannot do it directly. So instead we create some sort of a virtual sample. Create a virtual sample, meaning that what, what will be the measurement here? Okay, can we reconstruct somehow approximate the sample at this location? Uh, at this location, okay. And uh, when we construct this, we really need to because this this measurement, this sample is for the whole eight frames, right? So we have to consider okay, what would be the virtual 
measurement for these whole eight frames. Okay? So what you can do is you can do some sort of weighted blending. So you take half of this pixel. Okay? You take sort of the, to the total value here and you took half value here. Okay? You do a weighted average to create a virtual sample for this location. Does that make sense? So then you can compare these two values. Okay, so if you do that, you can you can com you can compute a uh, a score sort of between the difference be uh, uh, a score to measure the difference between these two blocks. Okay, so if you do that, you can sort of for you can say that for each block, what are the most similar blocks within this value? Okay, that will give you some regularization okay, for this whole process. So I will skip the details. I will show you some result. So this is the sort of the co uh, our uh, coded uh, sampling input. Okay. This is the our reconstruction result. This is a video. Let me just first go through each block. This is the ground truth, and uh, this is the so-called four explorer time. What does that mean? Is um, we have a regular video, and the, the explorer time is four frames. It's four frames long. Okay, so this is a regular video, and the explorer time is only one frame uh, long. Okay, so this is the. But for this one, it's going to be noisy, so we'll apply denoising to this frame. We'll get denoised one frame. Okay, so let me play the video here. So you can see that uh, these motions are sort of a jerky because the frame rate is low. Okay. So here we can reconstruct this uh, high, rate, high frame rate output. So why, that's why uh, it's, uh, it's, it's smooth. So let me do a tone mapping so you can better see it. Uh, Okay, so this is one thing. So there's some sort of close-up comparison between uh, for the details. So I guess the result is a, it's a little bit hard to see. So that word result is a little bit sharper than sort of denoised, uh, mm, sort of denoised the short X word uh, sampling. So this is another um, result that shows that this method is reasonably robust to, to complex motion. So why is the one-time exposure in the body middle not moving faster? Oh, here is the thing. So let me go back. So you can see that just for fair comparison, um, if we consider uh, one, two, four, eight, in total, we have a length of 15, right? We have a length of 15 frames. And uh, for this 15 frames, we only sample four times. So essentially, we're reducing the sampling rate by a factor of four. So to do, the fair, or to do a fair comparison, um, when we generated regular videos, we only sample uh, every four frames. Okay. So that's why you see the for the bottom row, um, the, these uh, short explorer and the long explorer uh, frames uh, videos, they, 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 they're, they're jerk here. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, so. I guess I have a question, just how physically realizable is it to have a different exposure in each pixel? Uh, actually, we, if you think about it, we don't need to set it. We don't need to set it. We just need to control when to read it. Uh -huh. uh, so we don't have a, uh, oh, sorry. Right, so just, we, you just have to read it. But how can, you know, if, given current silicon and the row column architecture on sensors and so on, mm -hmm. how do you read different pixels at different times? 
Uh, that's a good question. So I, I don't do circuit design, but I ask the ECE faculties. Uh -huh. They think this is a certainly doable because it's a purely a VLSI problem. You can give a mask, mm -hmm. they can read out whichever pixel you want. So right now you can, we can already sort of do a per row That's reading. Right. Yep. Uh, we cannot do this per pixel reading yet. Mm -hmm. But I, someone told me at CVPR that this per pixel reading is also possible. It potentially, I think it's possible that in the next iter generation CMOS sensor, this one can be uh, achieved. Okay. Yeah. So if it's possible by row, could you right now build a sensor that does the first row by one and the second row by four and third row? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's possible. We can do that. Uh, I suspect the result will be, in principle, the whole, the, all the method uh, in our paper can work with that. But my gut feeling is the result might be a little bit worse. So this is also confirmed in, I think, in <coughs> Columbia group. They, they tried this. If you have a per pixel control, you tend to get better result. And then not for this project. They did some other project. Um, they get the same sort of a empirical result. Yeah. Yes? Um, so I guess depending on like how sparse your readings are, uh -huh. um, I guess there's sort of a, uh, a range where if you read like many, many pixels, it, it might be just as uh, efficient to just read everything and then ignore. Uh -huh. Right, versus yeah, yeah. sort of setting like locations and then reading those. Do you have a feeling for like where that spot is? Because then you don't really need that extra logic to be able to read from the individual. Uh, that's a good point. So I think that um, then the special case is you just read every pixel at every high frame rate, uh, at uh, every frame, right? Yeah. So, but if we're talking about, let's say, 300 frames per second, then if you operate at that mode, you probably it will consume a lot of energy. So one, I guess one argument these compressive sensing guys are making is if you do that, if you, do sort of redu if you reduce the sampling rate, you will save um, power consumption. Yeah? Do you know if it is cheaper to read uh, blocks of pixels versus single pixels? Mm -hmm. It's possible, it's, it's possible. Uh, using the same idea of a mask. So in the mask, mm -hmm. if you have a two by two square, mm -hmm. is it cheaper to read the whole square together versus single pixels? Because it seems like there is possible to get in some more optimization by mm -hmm. considering blocks of pixels in this diagram. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's, that's a possibility. We, ha we haven't explored that, uh, that yet. Yeah. So it seems like sometimes the dynamic range in the scene is going to be limited. You don't need the 1 to 8x. Uh -huh. Right, right, so right, say right. If you wanted to turn off the eight X end of it, uh -huh. right, you only do one, one, two, four. One, two, four, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just don't have that much dynamic range in the scene. Right, right, so right. What happens then? To this diagram? Uh, it, it doesn't change. The, the it doesn't change. change. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. And conversely, sometimes maybe just the highlights mm -hmm. are. Uh, you know, there's just a very small range. A small, small area mm -hmm. that requires this uh, very short exposure. Right, right, right. Very short exposure, but then right. you're sacrificing the rest of the scene to, to capture that one thing. Uh -huh. right, 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 right. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, and more generally, you haven't really talked about spatial adaptation. So right, we haven't talked about this. Right, right, we haven't um, done that yet. But I know that there's one ICCV submission sort of trying to do this type of thing. Not from my group, from other groups. Yeah. Yeah. So did I show this? I probably showed this, right? So this is another example. So this is also. It's so dark, I guess I'll skip to this. It's just uh, you have a set of rolling dice. Um, those are all sort of a hard examples if you want to do a traditional optical flow-based uh, method to do these. Oops, sorry. So there are some artifacts here, but it doesn't sort of downgrade sort of drastically. So that's sort of 
something that we feel this approach might be uh, promising to handle really robustly for uh, fast motion. Um, so this is shows that uh, um, um, underlying this, we have an iterative method to do the reconstruction. This, we use this thing called the alternating direction method of multipliers. This right now, the method is slow. It re really requires quite some iterations to reconstruct the, the highlight. Because uh, for the highlight, a lot of pixels, the readings are sort of uh, invalid. We have to somehow fill in these values. Okay, so this example is where, uh, shows that uh, the limitation of this method, if you see this. Let me play this again. Okay, I stop here. And um, when you compare these methods, you can see that our method cannot completely, completely remove the blur, right? It sort of removes the blur for for the, these, uh, these locations which are closer to the center where the motion is slower and it's better than the long exposure time. But uh, it, for this very fast motion, we still cannot uh, completely remove the blur. Okay, so that's uh, right now the, the limitation. But the one way I think, one way to address this is to somehow um, adaptively you can throw in more shorter exposure frames um, to address this if you really want to get everything sampled correctly. Okay, so I'll skip this. Um, some future work on um, sort of optimal or adaptive explorer patterns and uh, more efficient reconstruction and uh, some real-time preview, right? So right now we can capture this. This one doesn't look so good, so maybe we can have some fast way of generating not not the perfect video, but some a little bit blurry video, but sort of regularly looking so that we can preview the content. Okay. Okay. So that's sort of a one part of my talk. So the, I'll continue on this. Uh, that's sort of the next thread, which is using multiple cameras. Um, Okay, so when we talk about camera arrays, so I think maybe 10 or 10 years ago, all the arrays are big. So, but now, more recently, we have seen this much smaller arrays. This is a, so you can buy this from Point Grey, and we have camera arrays of, sort of appearing on a cell phone. And also, so this is a paper in Nature this year, so we can really make the camera very small. So each of this lens, each of this little ball is a lens, Behind the lens, there's a uh, photoreceptor. So as you can see that this is a dome-shaped camera array. So the, the, this is a two millimeter. The whole thing is like a fingernail size. So okay. So there's it potentially. Then we can, we can later uh, in the future we can have this type of array appearing on our mobile devices. So one question is, okay, how, what kind of image processing can we do for these type of exotic uh, exotic devices? So one thing um, I did several years ago is, okay, if we have multiple uh, image measurements, and because the camera is very small, so the image quality won't be very high. So it's going to be noisy. Can we aggregate these images together to, to get a higher uh, quality uh, image? Um, sort of a, give you a sense. This is a sim if you work in 3D reconstruction, this, you know that this is a synthetic exa example. Um, so this is the one sort of a noisy image. Um, okay, so, so in this work, we assume that the, the, the noise is, uh, is dependent, dependent on, on the image intensity. It has this Poisson uh, distribution. Okay, so you can, we can co compare, sorry. Sorry, this, uh, this is the ground truth. Uh, so this is uh, our reconstruction. It sort of a, does a pretty reasonable job, except uh, you see that for the textual region, uh, regions. Okay. So I think I will sort of skip the details and just to show you uh, a couple of uh, results for this work. 
So for example, um, in terms of the noise reduction, um, we compare with sort of this, the best single image noise reduction. Okay, so this is BM3D method. Many people use it as a benchmark. And it does a pretty good job for removing noise, but it also has this blurry appearance. And uh, this is, uh, I think, in Mark Lavoie's group, the synthetic aperture denoising. It sort of, because it operates at each pixel sort of independently, in a sense, it doesn't work as well. Uh, so this is our method. It sort of really sort of recovers the details quite well compared to the ground truth. Um, so this is another synthetic exa example. Um, so this is the real example. All the images are captured using point gray cameras with the shortest uh, exposure time and uh, highest again. So this is quite noisy. And uh, um, this is a single image denoising. And this one, actually, what we did is we captured 25 images. Okay. And uh, we sort of treat this 20, these 25 images as a video and feed in the video denoising method. So they have a video denoising module as well. Surprisingly, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, just uh, improve. You, you just don't get the better result if you, if, you just, you, if you have more data. The reason is when you do this um, a video denoising, you still have to do the, some sort of a registration across the frames. And if you treat them as a video, then the degrees of freedom your computing optical flow, the degrees of freedom is much larger. But when we treat them as a multi-view denoising, there's a polar constraint um, we can use. So we can get matching much better. So that's why sort of in our result, we can get quite better um, result. What was the hardware setup here? How many, how many cameras? Uh, we have 25. In this particular, yeah. Well, well, there's the same camera. We just put, oh. them, put it on at different locations. Yeah. In the grid, the grid or line? In the in line, in the line. For the for this one, I think uh, it's a grid. Yeah. Well, this is a one example that shows that we can handle sort of signal intensity dependent noise as well. So when we do image denoising, we usually have to spe uh, provide a parameter. Uh, which is the noise uh, noise uh, standard deviation. So, but if we have if we have um, sort of a Poisson noise, if you set this value too low, then you don't remove the big noise. So, if you set this variance too large, then you sort of kill details as well. So, if we provide the sort of correct model, then you can sort of remove the noise, but also keep the uh, keep the details. So, that's one sort of feature in this work. OK, so, um, so how many views do we need? Um, we did some uh, empirical evaluation. This is the horizontal axis is the number of views. The vertical axis is the, the signal to noise ratio. Um, so you can see that some, uh, after a certain image, after maybe 20, the performance doesn't improve as rapidly as we hoped. So I guess there are two possible explanations. One is as you have adding more cameras. So all these cameras are front looking. So the common area they, see, they can see becomes less and less. So that's one thing. So the second thing is we're not purely just, uh, the noise reduction is not purely dependent on, uh, is, it, but, okay, so the noise reduction needs uh, some redundant measurement. And the measurement redundancy does not completely come from these multiple views. Within a single image, you can still get redundant measurement because of self-similarity, right? So if we have enough views to help, uh, to help, up and to help us to find accurate uh, self-similarities within a single image, then probably that's, that's enough. We don't need infinite number of views to, to sort of get a very high quality uh, noise reduction. Okay, so that's, uh, that's for noise reduction. We also did some work on exploiting um, camera arrays for uh, video stabilization. Um, so so this, these are some um, professional solutions for video stabilization. You have this me mechanical um, 
devices to damp out the motion, um, which is not very comfortable to use for consumers. So, and we have a, a many sort of a uh, algorithm-based uh, video stabilization method, and uh, they tend to assume what well, they tend to assume distant scenes and uh, similarity-based camera ro uh, motion. Um, and we also have some hardware-based solution. Let's say you have a floating sensor to compensate motion, or you have a floating lens to compensate motion. So, so all these works are, have limited degrees of freedom, and the motion cannot to be, be too big, so the base, baseline is limited. So this is a paper in, from Seagraph 2009. Um, so this is the type of scenes that we typically apply stabilization on. Okay. And uh, so usually we have these assumptions. So the background needs to have a lot of, sort of features we can do tracking. Okay. And um, so the, the, the dy dynamic targets need to be small. Okay. Um, so this is even in this CVPR, I saw a video stabilization method, which sort of works in a similar regime. Okay. So the type of things that will break the video stabilization is something like this. Okay, the, the motion is big. The background is sort of solid white. It doesn't have too much swift features for us to track. And, uh, and you have a large depth variation, so this type of thing. Okay, nearby, um, so these are the sort of challenges. And uh, we're going to show that uh, if we have a camera array, all these challenges can be, can be addressed um, in much, in the, uh, much more easily. So assume you have a camera array. This array is somehow vibrating in a 3D space. And uh, we can view this uh, stabilization as an image-based rendering problem. You just want to render a video along a smooth trajectory. So this concept is, we didn't uh, come up with this concept. This concept is mentioned in this paper. Okay, but they didn't use a ray. So we were arguing that if you have a ray, this, we, can, we can make this idea work much better. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. Um, and the, the reason the array helps is at each moment in time, you have an array, you can estimate the depth, and you can do image-based rendering to render all the scenes to that a particular desired viewpoint you want to form a smooth uh, video. Okay, so this video will sort of uh, demonstrate the concept. So you have a camera red. These red pyramids are, red cam are five cameras of the physical array. And uh, we only use five cameras we, uh, for this particular um, project. And, um, so this is one of the five input. It's sort of a, uh, vibrating a lot. So then this is the virtual camera. The virtual camera is sort of moving around. It's like a car suspension, right? So it's, the seat is stable, but the, there's motion between the seat and the, the frame. Okay, if you sit on the seat, then you see everything is stable. So that's the basic idea. Uh, is this that camera you just showed? So what's the... Yeah. The separation is um, 40 millimeter. That's okay, so yeah. pretty small compared to the scene. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is another compare. Uh, yeah. So you can see that this it's very hard to make the traditional video stabilization work on this type of maybe a little bit to sort of contrive the scene to try to illustrate the con concept. In those two samples, the amount that you're cropping out seems to be. Um, somewhat minimal compared to some of the other consumer grade um, stabilization techniques. Uh, by cropping out, you mean the... Yeah, the amount of video that gets lost. Right, right, right. We, we try to minimize that. You can sort of uh, somehow optimize the position so that the, the crop out region is somehow minimized. Yeah. Yeah. So you showed the cell phone, right, where the uh -huh. area was really small, uh -huh. really like centimeter or one centimeter. Mm -hmm. so this virtual view can mm -hmm. go outside the grid, the square, and then it becomes like an extrapolation problem. Mm -hmm. Right. So in reality, do you think this this 
this algorithm uh, would work. Like basically, the accuracy of depth estimation really it becomes yeah. If you need okay, if if these red cameras are closer, right. right? This blue one needs to go outside way more. Yes. Yeah. So then it becomes extrapolation. Yeah. The, the, that really, if you do that, it will be more. It's certainly much hotter. So the depth needs to be more accurate. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps it's in the stereo, the multi stereo from the light being light camera side. Right, right, right. Yeah. If you do interpolation, that's easier. Yeah. Okay, so um, so we compared with the result with oops. so iMovie. So it has a hard time to stabilize this. So this is another result. OK, so there's a one key thing in this method. So if we, do, if we implement this idea in a more straightforward way, we would run sort of some sort of a structure, structure for motion to get to the 3D trajectory. And then we sort of get a smooth from this red trajectory, we smooth it out to get the blue one. Okay, that's the more straightforward way of implementing this. If you do that, then we run into problems because you can see that uh, all these things, you don't have that many features to track, right? So the key sort of idea is when we do image-based rendering, we don't really care the absolute location, absolute location of the red trajectory. We only need to know the relative pose between the virtual camera and the physical camera. That's all we, we care about. We just need to know the relative pose. So then we can formulate it as an optimization problem. We want to find a sequence of relative pose such that if you generate this uh, virtual video, all the salient features, by salient features, I mean the edge map, will move smoothly in the virtual camera. So that's why we can completely avoid the structure for motion. So um, that. That's why we can sort of get to this, uh, get the result for all these very uh, difficult scenes. Okay, so if we can, we can generate one virtual view. We can also generate two virtual views. Then, if we have a goggle, we can, uh, you can imagine you see some three D movies out of this. So to get the concept. So if we have the depth, un, uh, so underlying this technique, we have the depth. You have, if we have the depth, we can augment the video with some sort of virtual object. Like say this virtual ball is rotating with the guy. Um, so we can, you can, we can easily model the occlusion relationship. Okay, so that's, for, yes. Yeah, how did you get the depth? Did you write your own stereo? For yeah, yeah, we have a few, maybe two or three depth map, depth estimation, CVPR or uh, papers. Yeah, we use those, yeah. yeah. Other questions? Okay, so, so then I will switch to another topic in terms of the image. Okay. <laughs> Uh, maybe just after this, I'll stop. I'll cut off the other stuff. Um, so, okay, we know that if we can estimate the rigid scene, 3D rigid scene, we can organize uh, images. Okay, so that's what uh, photo tourism, photo scenes is doing. So I've been thinking is, okay, if we, how about we extend this idea to non-rigid structure motion, non-rigid scenes. Okay, so. So one thing I did in my, when I was a student is if we can capture a whole lot of 3D shapes, then we can very easily navigate through the shapes and maybe come up with new shapes. So that the interface is like this standard graphics sort of interface where you manipulate the object, you get new shapes. Okay, so now I have been thinking, okay, can we use the similar interface for 2D images without getting into the 3D uh, reconstruction. So the, the one 
sort of a scenario would be, okay, this guy, Simpson, well, saw a person somewhere, and he forgot the exact shape, but uh, he can query faces. Okay, you get a whole bunch of face shapes. Okay, then he, this person wants to nail down, okay, from this millions of faces, how can we get the exact shape in my mind? I don't have the specific picture, but I have some rough idea. Maybe this person has a big mouth or a smiling face, something like that. So in order to do this, the difficulty is how do we refine the search result, right? So maybe a particular smiling style, a particular pose he wants, okay. So, but right now, for example, one interface we may come up with is, okay, given a current uh, retrieved face, maybe you can just drag the nose to the left, you get a set of uh, sort of front looking faces, okay. Uh, another example is you just do this pinch on your touch uh, pad interface, you get a set of sort of open mouth uh, face images. Okay, so this type of thing um, sort of exploits the geometric attributes, which are you know hard to say in the words, um, but it's easy to manipulate on your uh, cell phone or whatever touch uh, touchpad interfaces. So it could be could be useful for criminal profiling or photo management. So again, so I'll probably skip the details, just show you a prototype we built. Uh, ways to find desired face images. For example, we can drag a point on the nose to find faces with a specific leftward pose. The search results are shown on the right. By clicking on each search result, the full image appears. Internally, we rely on face alignment to establish the shape of each face in the database. We can optionally overlay the aligned shape for the current image. Note that for this search, pose was selected and expression was locked. This means that the system holds the expression constant while allowing the pose to change based on our edit. In this example, we will use two edits to find slightly leftward looking faces with open mouth smiles. First, we change the pose using one edit. The point used for this edit is shown in red. We can keep this point as a shape constraint in addition to a second edit. The intent of the second edit will be to change only the expression, not the pose. And so we deselect the pose option and select the expression option instead. We pull the mouth open to find slightly leftward looking faces with open mouth smiles. <clears throat> we can also search for more subtle types of facial expressions, as this example will show. Here, we aim to find frontal faces with closed mouth smiles. To accomplish this, we will use three shape edits. First, we adjust the pose. Second, we close the mouth. Third, we pull the corner of the mouth upward to generate a closed mouth smile. Okay, I guess you get the idea. So the to make it more useful, we have to lock down the identity so that you know the the the, the 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 identity doesn't just change. The problem in practice is we cannot find each actor or each public figure. It doesn't have all the different expressions, all the poses, you know, in our database. So we sort of uh, we have to remove that constraint. Okay. Um, okay. So. We have about 10,000 images, and uh, we do a pre-processing to get all the um, landmarks detected. That probably remove 5,000 because there's something, some alignment which are not very reliable. So we remove them uh, in our fi final search uh, database. But, but that's when you say you don't have the actor in all expressions, and that's because you're going to. Google image search or something like that, if you actually started uh, analyzing the movies, uh -huh. an actor over the course of the movie will probably pose in uh -huh. a lot that's of true, different That's true, that's true. Yeah, we didn't do that. We just use a some database 
uh, maybe Columbia or some other. I think Columbia, Columbia collected this data set. So yeah. Um, um, OK, so I think I need to wrap up just, <laughs> although I have some other stuff. Um, so one thing is the geometric attributes is not enough. So we really want to type in maybe red hair or the guy with a mustache. So we need some appearance attributes to make this thing more useful. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is we really need more robust uh, face alignment for this to be usable. Because it's, this, is, this is a little bit dif different from photosynthesis where you can take a million pictures of Statue of Liberty. If somehow the feature matching doesn't work, you can throw away maybe half of them, but you still have a lot. But here for faces, maybe we're interested in certain interesting smile or if you, can, if you throw that smile away, then you're really missing the point that the pictures that people may, be find, want, may, may want to find. Okay. So we, we really need this. And we, we have some uh, face alignment paper last year. And when we work on this problem, we realize a very, very difficult uh, problem in practice, which is all these different data sets. Each university has its own data set. And each data set has, a in, has different definition of landmarks. So for this one, the CMO data, has, data set has like 50 points. But for this data set, it has what, 20 points. So there's, it's very difficult to merge these data sets together to get a very robust, uh, to get a more robust uh, face alignment uh, uh, model. So how many more minutes do I have? Um, OK, so because of this, so more recently I've been sort of thinking maybe we, we want to have a different representation for faces. Instead of figuring out these landmarks, okay, uh, we can, for each pixel, give it a label, whether it's a skin, um, cheek or nose or teeth or hair. Right? So we want to use a soft segmentation as a representation for faces, which has probably handled the hair in the future. It's very hard to use contour and landmarks to, to model hair as well. So that's one motivation. And also we want to make this method sort of general so that we can use it for uh, street view scene as well. So I will just show you, I guess, uh, some the current result we can get. OK, so this is one sort of a result we get in last uh, ECCV. This is a frame by frame processing, sort of example based uh, sort of parsing of street view uh, scenes. If you pay attention, usually we miss smaller objects, but for the big objects like um, skies, buildings, road surfaces, we tend, tend to work. The method tends to work better. So that's for this. Um, so on faces, in this CVPR, we have a sort of a similar but different example-based method, which works quite well. We compare with other um, face segmentation method. Um, just give you a sense, show you a demonstration. So one nice thing, right now we cannot handle air yet, but with this sort of a segment-based method, it's possible you can, hand, you can model teeth. Uh, sometimes the teeth is, is an important cue if you want to uh, analyze the uh, lip region. Um, Do you get the same orientation um, with the labeling method versus the contours? So like before you were able to drag points to set the orientation or the, the gaze of the face. Can you still accomplish, accomplish that with this method? Uh, that's a good point. Um, this method you can integrate to the contours, the contours in. Yes. So you, in order to drag these points, you have to have some anchor point to drag, right? So this method, uh, for this segment-based representation, we can integrate with the contour as well. Yes, we can do that. Yeah. 
Okay, that's uh, that's I guess that's it.